pleasure to talk to James Fowler today about the 10 by 10 project. Which is a, we've had many conversations over the last, I don't know, a couple of months, really since I started working here a couple months ago. I'm, like, I'm sorry, I should introduce myself. I'm the curator at the Art Gallery in Mississauga. And I'm sure you all know that James Fowler is the curator of this exhibition. So we've had lots of little conversations over the progress of the show, but it's nice to kind of sit down and actually you know, share, you have so many things to say about this project. I mean, look, it's 10 years in the making, right? It's a real labor of love. So um, I think you know, it's, a, it's got a real history to it, and it's really special for us to be able to host it here at the Art Gallery of Mississauga for its, you know, the, not the 10th ultimate, 10th and final year of the project. So it comes with a lot of a lot of history, a lot of photographers, a lot of subjects that have been involved. Um, so we're just gonna, I'm just gonna ask James some questions and you know, the kinds of questions that will hopefully get us all more insight into what you've been doing to you know, get this project brought forward and so on. So I thought I'd just start by reading um, James's biography and then we'll <laughs> go from there. Okay. Because James isn't just a curator for this show, even though this is a huge project. Renaissance man, lots of things going on. So, uh, James Fowler's practice as a visual artist is complemented by his curatorial pursuits involving LGBTQ communities. Seeing a need for visual art programming during Pride Month, Fowler created 10 by 10 and has curated it since 2011. He's participated in the production of several exhibitions and events that center queer communities, including the Church Street Mural Project for Toronto's World Pride Month 2014 and is a founding member for the Throbbing Rose Collective that produced Me Rose, a queer art and performance festival from 2014 to 2019. So congratulations on it's realizing- It's a few things. It's a few things. Congratulations <laughs> on all of that. <laughs> and also realizing 10 years of 10 by 10. It's quite an undertaking. So I thought maybe we could just start at the beginning and you could talk about how this project came to be. Like you talked about it being something that came about as something that was missing during Pride. Yeah. Um, but how did that initial idea become this? Yeah, uh, through community. This is where like, it, it, it started in community. Um, I was a member uh, of the White House UU um, project in Kensington Market. It was like 26 people on the second floor of a former, I think it was like a judo dojo. Um, and there was um, a sort of a common space, uh, not much larger than the, the space kind of the quarter of the gallery. Um, and we had installed sort of clamp lights and we painted the floor and we did the walls. And we thought, let's like be able to sort of highlight all of the artists in this space. And so I was on the board at the time and I said, um, I'd like to do something during Pride. And there was another fellow that was there, Joey Bruni. Um, who works uh, for CBC? He does a lot of their print, uh, their print ad layout, and all of that stuff. And, and he said, well, "We should put together like a little book and have a little you know, exhibition or something." And, and so I think there was Joey Bruni, and I think another uh, young at the time, David Pike, uh, who was a photographer, who was the head of the varsity um, paper at U of T. He was the photo editor. And I really liked his work, and so I asked him. And just through conversation over maybe two weeks, we end up with I think eight people, and then we thought, let's do ten. And it was it was the idea of creating a space during Pride where you could sort of reflect on the community and maybe the contributions that people had made in the community, and then we sort of settled like let's do the arts. So to put some parameters on it. Mm -hmm. So it was queer people in the arts, but not just people who are sort of actors or have sort of their own discipline or practice, but also all of the people who work in the arts, um, who support the arts. So we thought, okay, let's look at people who are educators. Let's look at people who are philanthropists. Let's look at all the people who work in arts administration that work really hard to bring arts and cultural events to the public. And you don't, you know, often what happens is um, you find out like all of these great things that these people do, but who they are outside of maybe their practice or their contributions, we don't really know who they are and maybe their personal life. So let's sort of spotlight that as well. So, and that's why we thought let's do a bunch of queer people. Um, and it sort of took off from there. We did it uh, at the White House. It was uh, during Pride and 
It was a little sweat box. That I think the poor AC unit was like literally dripping. The ceiling was dripping. People showed up in drag. It was like a really fun event, but it was sort of, it was for that nexus of the people who are part of the queer community, but also part of the arts community and people who also work um, in, the, in the arts who have, who are allies who wanted to celebrate their sort of queer counterparts or, or members. Um, so there was a lot of people that showed up and uh, it was sort of down, down the road and then um, somebody asked me if I wanted to do it again and I said yes and uh, I was talking to Kayla Robertson who at the time was working at the Gladstone Hotel, now the Gladstone House, and uh, within a day he called me back and said the Gladstone would like to adopt this project. So I was like, oh, this is great. So we did it a second time, uh, another uh, 100 portraits and another 10 photographers. Um, and then I was asked at that opening if I would do it again. Uh, and as I've said before, in uh, my jovialness at <laughs> the opening, I said, uh, let's do it again. We'll do it for 10 years. And I think it was around year six, I was like, what have I done? <laughs> But I'm glad that, you know, it, through, through, through COVID, through the change in location, through like all of these things, it is because of the tenacity of the queer community and the people that I've worked with who are like, yes, you can do this, you can do this. Uh, you know, having people that are rooting for the project, who want, who call me, you know, it's those sparks that happen in the community where somebody, when maybe you're not feeling the best about something, who call and say, I want to be part of the project next year. And that's just enough to turn the wheel to get it to the next day and the next month. Because there's a lot of work that goes into each of these. So, I mean, so people are calling you. Saying, people are calling the yeah, it's, nice. it's nice. It's nice that the, like the project, the, the brand itself has sort of taken on its own life. And maybe people yeah. don't know who I am, but they know the project. Uh, and so by year four, it was sort of like people were like, hey, can I be part of your project? This is awesome. Of course that's, you can. That's the beauty of it from year to year, right? Because right. every year you have, I guess, 110, technically. People 110 involved. people. Right. So that's, you know, every year that yeah. that foundation is right. built and gets stronger. And, yeah. and that's a lot of people by you yeah. know, four or five that was, a, now, that was a magic formula. I think we realized after the first year. I mean, if you want a successful art opening, ask 10 people to be involved and ask them to ask 10 people to be involved. Yeah. So you have 110 people plus yourself, plus whoever else is involved in arts administration around a project. Yeah. You have 110 people inviting all of their friends to an opening and to participate in it. So we're like, this is a really great formula and it's yeah. something that I think I'll revisit again. I think it's super smart because it's it speaks to community right away. Yeah. Because there's so many people involved. And even when you know the proposal first came to me and I had, you know, are we going to do this as our, you know, our new show? Like, well, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Because yeah. we've got all these yeah. people. It's, it's, it's a proven exhibition that's been shown over the years. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a huge support for it. And then, and I know it's going to be a great opening. <laughs> and it's great after COVID, too, because to know that you're going to have, you want projects that people are going to come out for right. and, and right. sort of entice them to come back. Yeah. And that's why, we didn't, that's why we didn't do it during COVID, because so much yeah. of the project like, we, yes, we could have done it online. Yes, I could have just published it online. But so much of the project, you know, Christina Zeidler, I like to quote her when I think it was about year four, and I said, you know, can we keep doing this for the 10 years? And she said, absolutely. She's, she was the former um, manager of the Gladstone. Uh, her family designed it and owned the building. Anyway, um, and she said, you know, I love that every year I get to come out and it's like a homecoming and you get to see like all of the photographers who are now part of it. And it's like the like, walk of fame, like who's being brought into the fold yeah. and, you know, another hundred people get celebrated and sort of, and then previous year photographers show up. Like, yeah, so it's, of it's just people become really invested in a project like that and over time. Uh, and it's just something that I've learned from doing this project. It's like, when you do something like this, it really rallies a whole community of people around the project, and that has been its strength. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so I didn't realize that from the beginning, the subjects were all buried. It was from the arts community right. as a whole. So that right. hasn't really changed. Has right. anything changed in those 10 years about how you approach the project? Um, there's two things that have changed. One was, I think it was about year four, uh, Jade Rude, who is uh, a filmmaker, um, I liked her work, and she said, I, I, she proposed, she said, I'd like to do video. 
And so we kind of we push those parameters from being photography to lens-based arts. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I kind of like about the project is that there's always been people who want to, what I'll say is queer the project. Like, queer for me is about finding a, a stage position and then taking a position outside of that to say, if I'm not this, I'm something else. Right. And so for people to challenge me and to challenge the project, what is, you know, redefining what is portraiture, right? right? Redefining, you know, what is what is a contribution to the arts? Like, is somebody who is a, perform, a, a porn actor, is that somebody who is included in the art, who right. is an art form, right? right. Um, maybe somebody who's a librarian, is that an art form? Like, so really pushing boundaries on sort of those things. Um, mm. Uh, I thought it was sort of really, it's been interesting for the project. So that's, that's changed, um, and I think uh, as a white, cis, gendered gay man, I think it's been an amazing uh, learning opportunity for me um, to continue to take the privilege that I'm given in a space like this or in a, in a gallery space or setting and take that opportunity to very carefully curate who the photographers are so that there's always um, um, an opportunity for people who maybe are further marginalized to also have voice and bring in an entire community. So for example, behind us, these are portraits by um, Elle Flanders and Tamara Swetsky, collectively known as Public Studio, and all of these um, people are um, lesbian Canadian authors. So to be able to focus on that, or the, another person this year, Vince Ha, who is Asian, really focused on the, of the Asian community. Kim Fullerton, um, who um, had an accident years ago and is uh, living in and uses a wheelchair, um, decided to also focus on queer people in the arts um, who are living with various disabilities. So adding in that extra lens onto it and bringing those voices that are maybe further marginalized into the center, I think has been rewarding for me. Um, and it's been eye-opening and it's just, it's really enriched my understanding of what this project yeah, and I, it also makes me think about, I mean, your points of these too, you've always, I don't know if you've always done this, but I know for this exhibition you spoke about how you, over the years, encouraged photographers too, in terms of the way they display their work, mm -hmm. the Gladstone we're here, to play, like, right. to support that playfulness right. and encourage, all, you know, yes, it's these portraits, but think about how you actually want to show right. them and be, don't be afraid to... Right, right. It's the, the so all of the subjects are chosen by each photographer. Right. So I, I give a lot of agency to each photographer to say, you pick your your subjects. If you need help, if you are running out of people, if you don't feel like you know enough people, um, because of maybe you're just not connected to the particular community, um, I have a list as long as my arm of suggestions for you. Or if you you know I mean I remember in the very first year when uh, David Pike was involved and I said to him, I said, give me your list of people that you think would be good subjects. And that's just something I ask for each photographer. And I also say, you know, give me your list of like the people that would be like your dream subjects. And on his was A. a. Bronson and I sort of knew him for throwing through people and I was friends with him on Facebook. So I got off the phone with David and I sent him a note to A. Bronson on, on Facebook. And it just turns out that he, like the following weekend he was going to be in Toronto. And so this young David Pike was like, yeah, yeah, I'm taking a picture of A.A. Bronson. So, that's so um, and that's it's interesting because that photograph, when you see people do stories about A.A. Bronson, often I think without credit to David, that image gets used. I know there was a Nuit Blanche event that happened probably about two years after that, so that would have been like 2012, 2013, and somebody had a whole bunch of copies of that picture up somewhere. Oh, really? No credit to David, but. Yeah. Um, but it's just really nice to see how some of the photographs and some of the photographers from the project, how they've come through the project. Not to say that it's made them famous, I'm saying that there are young people who have come through the project and have then gone on to do amazing things. Um, JJ Levine just did a big um, show in Montreal uh, about queer portraits that sort of had started um, just before 10 by 10, and so it was a really good match. Um, Wynn Neely, who went on to take the picture of um, um, Elliot Page for the cover of Time magazine. It's been oh, involved. Wow, really? Yeah, and so, and then there's also been like 
professors that I've worked with. So um, April Hickox, who teaches at uh, OCAD University, yeah. and then being able to talk to these people and say, okay, who are your like rising stars? Who are your students that are graduating who are really great? And then approaching those people and saying, hey, you know what? I would love to include you into this so that somebody who's coming out of a university uh, education and you know, now you're part of the show. Right. With, with like people like internationally known artists. So yeah. it's a nice, uh, it's diversity upon diversity. Right, because it's a range of you know, emerging and established artists right, right, is the other thing. Right, like and they come from different walks of life. And then also, like you were saying, that I never wanted it to be a cost prohibitive project. I didn't want to be like, okay, everything has to be framed perfectly. So each photographer is sort of given free reign on you know, how they want to approach the project. Um, do they want to do straight portraiture? Do they want to do a whole bunch of process? Do they want to do something with video? Um, and then how do they want to present the work? Do they want to put maybe expensive frames on things? Or do they want to use earth magnets and put them all back to black? So. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, yeah. And what was I going to ask you something else? Um, I was going to ask you lots of things, but I have something in my mind. Um, what's my favorite mentoring? Um, all of this is escape. And it's all usually Toronto based, right? Or no? uh, it's been Toronto centric. Okay. I think, you know, you say one of the things that, change, that has changed. Um, I wouldn't say it's changed, it's something I would do differently uh, with the project, is that I would have paid more attention to not make it so Toronto-centric. Mm -hmm. Though I come from Toronto and I meet a lot of people from Toronto, we have had people from Halifax, we've had people from uh, the Prairies, we've had a couple of BC artists, we've had a few from Montreal artists, but I would say the, the, the large number of, of photographers have been uh, from Toronto. Right. So. It's nice that you don't, like, that you expand beyond that yeah. when you yeah. are able to. I think there was a BC person that was in it, and you know, I ran into them at an art opening, and I was talking about the 10 by 10 and how it's Canadian national, and they sort of were like, yeah, but it's really just Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, I mean, I, you know, in, in a perfect world, and, you know, funding is always a thing. You always have to find, like, these artists need to be paid, right? So right. all the photographers get paid. Um, and so there's always sort of a fun, the fundraising uh, run that I do from the beginning of the year uh, up until the exhibition so that these photographers are being paid. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, in a perfect world, if I had funding and someone said, okay, you know what, well, you know, Canada doesn't have a, a queer mandated um, uh, art gallery. It doesn't have, there is no queer art center in Canada. There, there's the, like the Leslie Lohman that is in New York City. And uh, just most recently, the, um, uh, in London, they have uh, Queer Britain, which is a, 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 a gallery that is dedicated to showing uh, queer contemporary art and also uh, the ephemera um, from sort of history. Um, we have in, in Toronto, there's the, the archives, which has all of the sort of right. archives, right. queer, ephemera and stuff like that and they, they used to they, they used to and oh, I did it I did an exhibition um, there a number of years ago called Queer in Space where we took like objects from their collection mm -hmm. and asked um, artists to sort of respond to their collection and make new contemporary work yeah. uh, which I thought was sort of interesting but um, but they don't do that anymore. they don't they don't do that anymore no so it would I mean in a perfect world it would be great to continue this project you know and, but I also thought, like, do I want to be 75 and be like, you know, well, I'm going to try the anniversary of the 10 by 10. And I, you know, um, there's other projects that I want to work on. Uh, I do want to open this up uh, to an annual call where photogra queer photographers can submit their work. Right. Um, and then we'll put it online and so that the online website works as a sort of a, a queer Canadian wiki kind of site where, you know, yeah. you can read about all of these people and then sort of has like addendum years. Um, but there's some other projects that I want to work on. That's great because I think I've had a lot of people saying, this isn't really the final year, is it? I've had people, yeah, I've had people elbow me. Yeah, they're like, you're coming back. You're, but it's, you know, I can't do like 10 by 10 by 10 and then do 10 by 10 yeah, by 10 yeah, you plus one, that. right? Yeah. You kind of have to like bite off a chunk. So it has to go to 15 or It's like a TV series, right? A TV you have to know There's a the spin off. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can jump the shark, so you can jump the No, but you know, it's been suggested that we take the entire collection and either do like a best of or do. Know, maybe something for contact would be nice, maybe of, of, of having a space where you can come through and see the entire collection as a whole body of work would be oh, kind yeah. of nice. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, 
like I said, I like the formula. You know, when you take, um, when you look at the queer community and you look at the arts community in sort of a Venn diagram, they're pretty eclipsed. Like, you know, working anywhere in the arts and not the other, not meeting any queer people, I would be like, that's really abnormal. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, well, where can we shine a light? Excuse me, where can we shine a light where um, maybe a light needs to be shined um, or shone, uh, as it were? Uh, and I thought about the um, uh, athletics, uh, mm. you know, about um, the uh, sports industry and how we really need to create some visibility there. So taking the same sort of 10 by 10 formula with 10 queer Canadian photographers and doing people who work in the sports industry. So mm -hmm. it could be anyone from like a, a queer gym teacher, you know, where sort of dreams are made, right? Kids come out of school and maybe some queer kid who's like, I want to be a football player, I want to be a whatever. Uh, and that dream gets squashed, but they maybe have that sort of that queer gym teacher who's like, you know what, you can do that, so. Um, it's a nice place to bring it to because, I mean, a queer presence in the arts is something that has a foundation where right. it's like, yeah, like we're not there right. with sports, right? Right, right. I think, I think creating visibility and normalizing yeah. queer people in sports uh, is something that we still need to work on. You know, it's it's another frontier. I think. Right. You know, I mean, you look at places where uh, homophobia um, is is uh, culture, right? You have like in business and education. There's all, all kinds of forays that we can look at. But I thought, and there's a few um, films that are out there right now. I know uh, Malcolm Ingram did a, uh, a film, a documentary. He's a Canadian filmmaker, and it was called Hooked to Play. Uh, about queer people in sports, and I know that he worked with a number of the sports clubs and got some funding for that. So uh, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. So there's two elements to each view. There's the there's the exhibition, but then there's also the catalog. Which yeah. But a little bit, which is I mean they operate differently. We have to hold it up. <laughs> I think there's like four copies left. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it too, right? Is, yeah. And then this also speaks to the grassroots nature of the program. Right. So like you're talking about, I mean, backtracking a bit, but talking about it being, you know, largely Toronto-centric, but that's also out of necessity. You can't like you're you're right. real. Like let's make this happen no matter what. And, right. and you know you don't have you know, tons of grants at your disposal work with so right. it's a real labor of love to be able right. to produce right. those exhibitions and to produce a full book like this. I mean yeah. it's, a, it's a beautiful document, right? It, it is. Um, it started actually it's funny because the first ten by ten book, which if anybody has one you're lucky because I think there were only like I think sixty first Really? Yeah. And it's seven by seven. <laughs> and it wasn't until the next year that we were like but let's make the book actually ten by ten the book is actually ten yeah. by ten. Yeah. Ten, yeah. ten by ten yeah. inches. That's great. Um, uh, Kevin Cover uh, the first, the first year, Joey Bruni uh, produced the book. Um, we sort of worked on it together, and we did this really quickly too. Like, uh, it was, uh, I think it was like April, and we thought, okay, and I think it was like done in like six or eight weeks. We had all the photographers, all of the photos wow. done, everything was printed. Uh, uh, the book was published. Like, it was that's just of, like, right? let's do this, right? Like, and 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 that's the thing is that every year this has just sort of become a thing that you know my partner is like. Oh, it's like first go. of February. Here we go. It's the great run to ten by ten. Yeah. And he's like, I've become this art widow, and I don't see him. He's <laughs> like running out the door or whatever, sort of working on it. But um, Joy Bernie worked on it uh, one year, um, um, and then um, another friend, Chris, worked on it. And then I think from year two or year three to the end has been Kevin Cover, who has um, donated his time. For this project, like that's amazing. Yeah. So big yeah. ups to, to Kevin, who didn't, he wasn't able to make the opening. Actually, wasn't in town. I was okay. really sad. Yeah. We bought him flowers, and I like I was showed up at his place like two days later when he got home, and I'm like, these flowers are for you. Right. <laughs> so, um, so it's a labor of love from a lot of people. Oh yeah, right. I mean, there's like there's a, another person, uh, my friend Gail, who. Uh, is like a spelling bee queen. She's like gone through and she did all like the editing for the book. And so it's like, again, it, it's about the sort of a community of people who come back year after year and like how can I help and yeah. um, you know, putting, putting the book together. And it's like, 
you have, you have, you know, putting a hundred people's bios into a book is a, a task unto itself. Absolutely. And then asking a photographer, like asking an artist to be organized. <laughs> uh, so, so chasing down people. I remember one year, uh, I can't remember who the photographer was, but I said, can I please have, can you please put the bios in? And I think in the, because we had like this like online spreadsheet and they, and they put like links to like their person's website. And then another person like cut and posted like a cut and pasted like an eight hundred word bio. <laughs> it was like fifty words. Yes. You get fifty words like like this huge bio and I'm like uh, and Gail, you know, just went and like, right. there you go, there's your fifty words. Right. So, um, but for the most part people can think. Yeah. And it's different though, right? Like realizing the project in book form versus the exhibition. Because this, I mean, obviously because of the way the book works, you launch it at when the exhibition yeah. opens, so you don't have in it documentation of how the work looks. In no, space, no, it's right? really, it sort of lives, it's it, thing, it lives right? on its own. And it's funny that you call it a catalog. I've always called it a book, and a lot of people, a lot of people will call it a catalog. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we wanted to do with the book was to not make it feel catalog -y. So right. when you go onto each page, like it doesn't have all the bios. And that was actually something that came in, I think, in the, the second year. It was a recommendation. Like every year we sort of tried to improve it. Uh, and one of the improvements was that in the back there's an, like an appendix or whatever uh, that has like all of the, the names oh, and then the right, little bios right. that are in the back. Yes, Just yes, to yes. give yep. someone yep. context, like who is this person? Like, and this is one of the things that I have found like with the, the exhibition is you, you know, if you don't have that piece in the back, you walk through and you might know some of these people and recognize them. But you're like, well, why is this, why is Susan in this? Like, yeah. who is she? Yeah. Right? Somebody might know who she is, but you know, like, why is Jane Rule in this? You're like, you don't know who Jane Rule is? Like, yeah. so, so that's sort of a little bit of a, a road a road map for people mm. to sort of understand like why is this person significant? And, and and again, when I do the calls and I work with the photographers, it's always been like, you know, um, I've asked people to try particularly like white cisgender people. Can you please like be diverse in the people that you're representing? Right. We had a year where I had two uh, gay, cisgender, and white men, and all they all they did was white men, and it just it showed. It was glaring. I was yeah. like, no. Um, so, anyway. And so it would be amazing too to have the, because these exist as, as books mm. to have the 10, 10 by 10. Yeah, it would be nice to have a nice bathing style, big coffee table book. With yes. Yeah. Next project. Next project. <laughs> Next project. But I think, like going back to this, the formula, I think it's just like it's such a great exhibition formula and a book formula. You get so many people involved in it. Mm -hmm. it it's a it, it instant way to build a community around it. So. Yeah, and that, actually, that makes me think about. Um, I thought you could talk a little bit about the importance of the Lux Award in yeah. relation to this project. Um. Um. So I think it was in the. Second year, we decided to do what's called the Lux Award. The Lux is a unit of light, and we wanted to. Uh, in the very, actually, in the very first year, um, uh, we had John. Oh my goodness, I'm blanking on names. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, Will Monroe, who um, many will know, is the person who was around the Vaseline parties and was a queer art maker. Um, uh, he passed away, um, and John Caffrey, um, who had Polaroids of all the Vaseline parties, uh, so I went to John Caffrey, and he was actually in um, uh, the first uh, edition of 10 by 10 and so we used all of his Polaroids from the Vaseline parties, and that was our way of including Will Monroe into the book. And that got me thinking that, you know, there are so many people who have already passed who have not been included in 10 by 10. Mm -hmm. uh, because often it's people who are living artists and people haven't reached back. I know, you know, public studio Jane Rule has passed away and Jane Rule was actually a recipient of the Lux Award. And so what we did was we created a page at the very beginning of the book um, that uh, speaks a little bit about um, someone, a Canadian, pre-Canadian in the arts who's made some sort of significant contribution um, to the arts in their lifetime. Timothy Finley was one of them. Um, um, who else has been, um, 
Uh, so it's just a, it's sort of a small way of, of sort of curating into the project people who weren't living as an opportunity. I know one person in, I think year four, um, did uh, portraits. Uh, they were old portraits that she had taken when she was younger of people who all worked in the arts, like hairdressers and wardrobe people that worked in the theater. She was sort of a theater person, and so she had a lot of her male friends. And uh, all of her subjects were people who had died uh, as a result of HIV AIDS. And so, which was really odd in the at the opening, because often what happens at the opening is all of the subjects show up and the photographers are there, and it's a big celebration. And it's like, thank you for being part of this. And then you went to her area, which was sort of on the third floor of the Gladstone Hotel at the time, and it was very quiet. Like, there was none of those people were there, and none of their families were there. And it was just sort of like, it just made me really sad, but also sure, really sad. Yeah. But really grateful that those people got to be included in the project. And right. so the Lux Award has just been something really special that we right. want to do to acknowledge people that are no longer with yeah. us. And because, I mean, we talk about you know, the history of 10 by 10 as a project, but this is a project that's very much you know, representing the queer community. And so you're also talking about a history of that community over the right. years, too. And I know we've talked a little bit about you know, HIV AIDS and, yeah. and how this project has lived through some of that. It's, it's and I talk about the changes over the years. Uh, it, I mean, it's, I mean it's, changed, it's changed over the years. Um, there's some other projects that we're looking at right now, we we're talking about like looking at the history of uh, Canadian fashion and how, you know, if you look at say the last 50 years of Canadian fashion and fashion cares and how we went through sort of hyper masculinity or sort of butch look and how fashion has changed over five decades and then the impact that HIV AIDS has had on the community and what has come out of, of that, so like the fundraising efforts of fashion cares and then there's sort of the 80s had so much androgyny and so that's that's a separate project from this okay. um, I don't know that um, uh, it has had a direct correlation other than there are people who are obviously living with HIV AIDS um, or have passed away as a result of, of having that um, but that's a separate sort of a separate project yeah 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 and how will that become realized? Do you think? We have some proposals out right now. Nice. Uh, uh, it, John Rubino, um, who was a photographer for this year, um, photographed someone who's uh, closely related to the uh, to Fashion Cares. I know some of the people have passed away, and that was through like Mac Cosmetics and stuff. And that's really interesting too. You know, as 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 a project grows up, and like uh, it's sort of like the art community too, where like you know uh, an executive director will leave, and then a uh, a curator will leave, and like how so, so things sort of change, change hands. There's like a this sort of changing of the guard, if you will. Okay. Uh, and I just feel like I'm, I'm hoping that you know, in, that I've done 10 by 10, and I hope that it has sparked something in other people. Um, someone said to me years ago that life is about making, what is it, making, developing relationships, it's about meeting people and like leaving a legacy. And they describe leaving a legacy as the positive impact you have on someone such that they go and do something positive and so forth and so forth. And so I hope, my hope is that somebody has seen this book or somebody has been to one of these ex exhibitions or somebody has come through the project and it's inspired them to do something awesome as well. And I hope that in the void that you know next year it's not going to be around, I'm hoping that other people are inspired to go and do uh, other projects that create visibility for those communities. My <laughs> so I thought maybe I don't. I have some other questions, but uh, I can also open it up to. Does anybody have any questions for James about the project? Or Somebody better have a question. Or a comment or awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> I have you all to myself, so I just wanted to check. <laughs> subject matter or the style has changed over 10 years and uh, broadly like do you see that the mm -hmm. UK community is seen in a different light or it sees itself in a different light or yeah that's a great question I do I think that the, the queer community 
uh, in the last 10 years, certainly in the last 25, has been, you know, I mean, you look at things like uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, how it's become ubiquitous, right? It's like there's straight people that have RuPaul's Drag Race watch, like watching parties, right? So I think that um, maybe, uh, I wouldn't say that there's been a change in maybe how, like we'll say, how we see ourselves. Um, I have seen a great diversity in how the work has been, um, how portraiture, like how people want to define portraiture. Um, one of the things that I did notice uh, that has changed is I think one of the photographers this year in the biographies included pronouns, which I think is, you know, I think one of the things that's happened, uh, you know, in, in more recent years is uh, sort of gay cisgendered men have gotten a lot of the things that they want, particularly in, in liberal Toronto or liberal Ontario or Canada. Um, but I think that there's still a lot more to do and as we are given that hand up that we also reach back into parts of our community that are further marginalized, uh, particularly the trans community and, and create visibility around them. And so that's been kind of a small a small change, but um, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. A little bit, maybe. <laughs> Good enough. Open -ended. Open -ended. It's an open-ended question, yeah. So, did everyone get a chance to see the entire exhibition? Have you, have you no? Has anybody been to an exhibition in the past? A past have I done exhibition? Okay, cool. <coughs> awesome, good. That's great, do you have any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> I could just talk for hours. <laughs> walk people through here, like, you know, people have access to the book, you know, the information that we've put up right. didactic-wise. Is there anything you wish you could say to people as they come through here that you'd like to be able to share that is tricky to do? One of the things that, so every year I've always asked sort of a, a scholar or an academic or somebody who writes uh, about uh, photography or queerness, mm -hmm. um, Shem Rogerson, um, Sophie Hackett, who is the assistant uh, curator at the Art Gallery of uh, Ontario, um, um, who else? Uh, Francisco Alvarez, um, uh, Suzanne Cart, all of these people have always written an introductory essay to go with the book. They offer a lens through which to look at each collection, and each of them have brought something to the project uh, sort of a different a little bit of a different lens like mm -hmm. so some of them talked about community um, uh, Shem Rogerson talked all about the, the history sort of the scholarly history of the word queer right and so that was sort of an interesting way um, um, Sophie um, Sophie uh, Hackett made these a really sort of nice analogy of like this idea of the 10 by 10 is an aggregate a community aggregate that sort of these rivers of people from you know various communities sort of come and they meet in this sort of central place. Um, Pamela Mathro, who um, is one of the subjects of, uh, of John Rubino this year, who also wrote an introduction, um, really uh, made this kind of a profound um, observation of the exhibition that often when we see exhibitions featuring people who are marginalized, um, or particularly in the media, is through their instances of trauma, right? So like, look at, look at the riots that are happening, or look at how these people have been put in prison, or look at who, how these people are oppressed. Um, and so not to negate that, but rather to offer a counterpoint. Um, 10 by 10 serves as a place to reflect upon the extraordinary contributions that queer people have made to the arts. Uh, I've been asking for like why queer like you know because it, like you were saying like we were saying that like how it's it's changed and it's much more uh, normalized. Um, I go back to the essay that Shem wrote that talked about when we queer something that we create an opportunity to improve or ameliorate the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you say like hey you can't go this way like pruning something, right? And you have this, you need something, something that it stops it growing this way. It's going to find another way. And that's very much what a lot of queer people go through, right? They're told, like, this is, this is the way you have to go. You're not allowed to be a little bent 
Uh, and so through that experience, we're sort of, we're primed to look at things maybe from a different perspective. Everyone is going this way, what happens if I go that way? And when you do that, you're experimenting, you're creating sort of that path less traveled, and maybe there's a new thing that can come out of that. And I think that that's been a really profound thing for me that I've realized through working on the project. That's a good place to end. That's all we wrote. <laughs>